Thank you all very much for coming. I hope this presentation is not going to ruin your lunch, uh, given the subject is um, uh, the Via Fura. If I can just give you some uh, background to where this idea uh, came from. It came about as a result of seeing what the Serious Games Institute were producing for commercial operators. In, in this particular case, it was a presentation that they put together for Jaguar Land Rover. And it was a simulation of the factory facilities of Jaguar Land Rover and also <coughs> their offices. And while I was looking at this presentation, it occurred to me that, of course, one could be anywhere. And with my historian's hat on, I still sometimes claim to be a historian. <coughs> I see colleagues that are written, but nevertheless. <laughs> and I wondered whether what the SGI was doing could be adapted to the delivery of history. The whole idea of immersive learning. Give the students the idea of actually being present at particular historical events. And in this particular case, my mind turned to a particularly important conference in Berlin on the 5th of November, 1937, the so-called Hotzbach Conference, where Hitler laid out his plans, his immediate plans for German expansion. And at this meeting, he had the heads of the three armed services, the foreign minister, his adjutant, and he outlined his plans for Germany to simultaneously seize Austria and Czechoslovakia in the near future. It's a particularly important turning point in German foreign policy in the lead up to the Second World War. And of course, by the very fact it was a secret conference, only those seven people in the room were present. What you're going to see today is a work in progress. As I say, I'm working with the SGI they are producing a simulation of the Reichschancellery uh, in Berlin. It's a study in particular uh, where this conference took place. It will have a 360 degree uh, movable picture so that students can move around the Reichschancellery when Hitler is speaking. The voiceover has already been done. And there will be various hotspots that the students will be able to hit upon when they play the simulation in their module from Moodle. But as I say, at the moment, this is very much a work in progress, but I'm hoping that even what I can show you today will give you quite a good idea of what we're doing. We're hoping very much that it will be a great benefit to the university in terms of promoting it, very much leading uh, within the field of immersive learning, which some of you may already be tapping into. You see a number of American universities in particular who are moving down this line as well. So what I'm going to do today is a two-minute introduction, which I'm hoping will grab the attention of the students, and I'm hoping, Paul, that it'll be very useful for the teaching and learning uh, showcase events that you've got in mind for February. Uh, then I'm going to show you some of the images that the SGI have already produced, uh, together with the hotspots, which take you to documentary evidence, ask the students questions, and then at the end there is a timeline which has been produced by uh, Fitzgerald Adams <coughs> in the Learning Enhancement Unit, which runs all the way from 33 to 1939 with lots of further links that the students can tap into in order to place this conference within the context of German policy in the 1930s. But before I say anything further, um, I'd like to uh, say just how helpful um, which Sherrod Adams has been, and uh, see Dorota, Dorota Glinsky at the back from the Learning Enhancement Unit, they couldn't have been more helpful. So anything that's good about this presentation today is a consequence of their efforts, and I hope you bear that in mind. So, let's have a look at the introduction.
um, what we're hoping, as I say, this is a work in progress, so that's going to be the introduction. Uh, and then what I'm hoping will happen thereafter is that um, we will go straight to the Reich's Chancellery room. And this is the image that the SGI produced at the moment. This, uh, the Führer just arrived in the George Yellow building only yesterday. <laughs> uh, perhaps that's why you saw a bit of a kerfuffle going on. <coughs> but the idea is that um, there will be hotspots associated with the map so that students can be taken to a map of Central Europe so they can see where Austria and Czechoslovakia uh, are. There will be other hotspots taking them to uh, concepts of Lebensraum and various information re related to that to the rearmament effort of uh, Germany in the 1930s and where that sits with the rearmament efforts of Britain and France as well. There'll be a total of 10 of these hotspots and at the end there will be a hotspot which will take them to the documentary evidence for uh, the conference itself together with a quiz which I shall be writing for the students to undertake so that we can determine exactly what they're understanding and getting from this presentation. As I say, this is a static image, which is rather a shame, so I had hoped that uh, we would have the 360 uh, degree the virtual reality ready by now, but unfortunately not. But hopefully you can see, get some idea of exactly what it's going to look like and how this simulation will work, I hope. <clears throat> As I say, the voiceover has already been done. We're just waiting for the SGI to complete the, uh, the simulation. Uh, they've been working on other parts of uh, the uh, Reich Chancellery, so it will give you some idea of how the students will be able to move around the Bureau of Study. Okay. Now, what will these hotspots contain? Just to give you an example. At the beginning of this presentation, Hitler talks about the need for Germany to secure a Lebensraum, living space, in order to uh, secure the future of the German Aryan race. So, hotspot one lights up when the word Lebensraum is mentioned, and it takes you to, um, uh, in this particular case, a piece by uh, Professor Jekyll uh, explaining Hitler's ideas about German, German future, together with examples of more contemporary historians and underneath each of these hotspots, there will be a number of questions to try, try to direct the student's mind in terms of what they're picking up from the information that they're receiving. So all of the hotspots will be in this particular kind of format with lots of uh, documentary evidence, because one of the things we also want to do as historians, and I'm sure plenty of other people in this room want to do as well, I need to put my arm down, sorry. Uh, <coughs> uh, some of my students say, say this about me. Um, is to get the students involved with the evidential basis for the assertions that they're later going to make. And so this is one way of trying to, in, in the new environment in which we're uh, teaching and learning, to get the students engaged in that <coughs> evidential basis that they need to understand in order to get the, the very best marks, which we all, of course, want them to achieve. And finally, In the final hotspot there will be this timeline to take them all the way through the period from 1933 to 39. And this is something that um <laughs> As you run through the timeline from 33, you see the development of German policy to the point where Hitler believes he has the opportunity now to take advantage of um, the weakness of Britain and France in particular. And in each of these uh, hotspots there are various uh, links to video material, YouTube material, documents, for example. So once you click on one, the music stops and uh, the associated link will play for them. This is about the remilitarization of the Rhineland on Saturday, the 7th of March, 1936, which was a particularly important turning point in securing Germany's frontiers in the West, which were, of course were a necessary precursor before any advance could take place in the East. And so all the, the links will be of a similar nature, give the students more and more background, more and more information to try to 
ensure that they can understand the developments of German policy in particular, as a particularly large pair of spectacles, I don't know where you got those from. So that's what we'll play right at the end, to put the whole conference within the context, as I say, of German policy in the 1930s. Yes, we do. We've got the evidential records, and uh, the voiceover has already been undertaken. Uh, naturally, in my inimitable diplomatic fashion, I asked a German colleague to do it, uh, which he was uh, happy to do. So that's uh, what we'll do. And as the, um, as the particular point <coughs> that I want to highlight in this delivery, um, like Lebensraum, there will be a hot spot which will light up. And I, what I want in that particular case is to take them to a map of Hitler's geographic intentions all the way to the Urals. But well, hotspot is a link. It will be, yes. So it's a, it, it's a hotspot in the sense that it's an item in the... It's flashing it's to tell them the that there's, a, there's more information on that particular point that Hitler's making at that moment. Which is a map or a book it or could be, yes, in the, yes. earlier in the room. Indeed, or a documentary base, anything like that. That's the plan, anyway. Yes, sir. Could you go into a bit more detail on the process of actually getting it done with the SGI and what investment and time and time scale? The Director of Teaching and Learning, <laughs> as you can hear, um, this particular project is quite an expensive one. And without the support of the Executive Dean and indeed Paul, this would not have got off the ground. But what it is showing, it's an exemplar of what can be done. And as we're working through this, we've got other members of staff uh, in ISS who are now um, <coughs> had these ideas in mind, have been aware of this, and are now developing their own projects using <coughs> software to create their own sim sim <coughs> simulations. Um, I hope you don't mind if I steal your thunder, Darren, uh, Darren Reed and uh, Brett are working on a simulation to deal with slavery in the Caribbean. And in this particular case, they're not going to be working with the SGI, they're using a platform which uh, we're endeavouring to buy a licence for from an which is a very much cheaper enterprise. But the principles will be much the same, because the great expense here is um, producing the simulation, the accurate simulation of the study itself try and immerse the students in actually being at that conference at that time. So although this is quite expensive, uh, these <coughs> software packages we're talking about about $100 a time. And, as I understand it, Miranda will correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, once you pay that $100, you can use what you've uh, produced in a commercial sense, which is something else that we've been thinking about with regard to this sort of... Frank also started work on this before we even had the LEU in place, so this project takes about two years. Oh, no, it's not long that one. It just seems that way. <laughs> well, it's 18 months. Oh, yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. two last questions. James and Tim, then we'll move on to the okay. That's really good. I was just wondering, do you think there's any potential for actually making it more like a game? It looks like a, looks like a computer game. Of course, some of this is coming on the back of, you know, the gamification idea. Yeah, so whether, you know, as so a they can make, this, make decisions. Well, but, yeah, this is the thing. I did wonder about having a rerun of the Second World War to you interview. Both of you with my historian's hat on. Uh, I don't think I can quite well, go down. They could look at two different documents. So which ah, yeah, but then you have, uh, you, you have the historical record, wouldn't you? And then you have the counterfactual history, which yeah. whatever you said could be right. I know what you mean, though. I thought that could be quite interesting. It could be, especially as uh, the outcome changes. Yes, sir. Yes, I have oh. a question. <coughs> Sorry, Justin, Tim was first. Oh, sorry. Right. You can go. You can't see us, though. That's okay, I'll let you go. You can wait with me. Tim is after, then we finish. Okay, Justin. Sorry. 
The question I have is, um, there's a turn in higher education for materials going open access and creative commons. Yes. And obviously, if this is something you can showcase, it might be more beneficial to do that. Have you, has that been considered? It certainly has. One of the problems associated with this, and this has been very much a learning curve for me, and I uh, must admit, I've learned an awful lot in quite a short time from Amanda Fitz and all the other people in the learning enhancement unit, and indeed what's going on in the DMLR as well, as a consequence of this. One of the issues associated with this is exactly that point about license, and how one can <coughs> use these materials in a more broader context. And it certainly has been thought of, uh, but it is a particular restriction at the moment, because many of these documentary <coughs> links and links from um, sources in the library are linked through Curve and Equella into Moodle. But the licensing agreement for that digitization to take place only allows students who are presently on a particular module to look at those sources. So we would have to redraft if we wanted to go down a commercial application. And believe me, the idea of a commercial application is not very far from my mind at all. In fact, it was right at the front of it when I was thinking about doing this. But I'm hoping that what Darren and Brett are working on in ISS as well, we may be able to um, develop these packages using the software that they're using and having that uh, copyright and license in order to have these packages not only to enhance the reputation of uh, the university, but I'm hoping this matters such as this might be used on open days, for example. Um, just, the, just the front intro could be used on open days, might be a little bit different. Um, but the, certainly the commercial application uh, is uh, something we are looking at very much. Okay, Tim, last question. Um, yeah, I was just wondering um, how much thought you give into how you actually use it on the present courses. I mean, is it entirely intended as at the moment it's going to be used in the computer labs um, with specialized um, timetabling uh, arrangements <coughs> for the delivery of this particular aspect of this particular module but one of the reasons why i wanted to come along today was to um, see what other people had to say about it and the ideas that they have so I, I know that we don't uh, operate um, in a silo mentality. We don't deliberately do that, but I know there are lots and lots of people across the university doing lots and lots of things. But that's how we see this, this uh, not this project, sorry. Um, this particular project working at the moment is going to be embedded within a module.